As we stand, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence. May your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and your greater glory our supreme concern. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I want to focus this morning on verse 34 in that passage we've just heard from Luke's Gospel. So Luke 13, verse 34, words of Jesus. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. I remember some years ago making my first visit to Canterbury. My timing was unwittingly quite perfect because at Canterbury, as the city came into view, it was evening and the rays of the dipping sun lit up the famous cathedral in a way that just took my breath away. It was a dazzling sight and I was thrilled. I'd always wanted to visit Canterbury because of its religious and historical associations. And at last, I was there. Well, Luke, in his Gospel, reminds us that Jerusalem was the focal point of our Lord's travelling and ministering. Capernaum, Nazareth, Caesarea, Philippi, all had their place in his itinerary of salvation. But it was Jerusalem that marked the end of the road. Leading up to the point in today's Gospel reading, Jesus has been teaching in many places and talking about the Kingdom of God and of the things that are to come. He has a clear sense of his own work and where it will inevitably lead him. But he's not the only one who can see where things are heading. The Pharisees too can see what may happen and appear to be warning Jesus of a great threat from Herod, that is, Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, who died soon after Jesus was born. What is unclear is whether this is out of genuine concern for his well-being, or whether they are trying to frighten him into leaving Galilee. To Jesus, Herod is that fox, destructive, tricky, sly, politically motivated. Jesus, however, is convinced that his mission must be carried out in a specific way, and neither the Pharisees nor Herod himself will be able to hinder that. In chapter 19, Luke records Christ's triumphant approach to Jerusalem and how the crowd shouted, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. And without doubt, many who traveled to Jerusalem with Jesus on that Sunday before his arrest and trial were thrilled and excited as the city came into view, with its glittering pinnacles and the spacious courts of the temple. Christ would have come from Jericho, where the lives of Zacchaeus and Bartimaeus had been completely transformed. He would have come along that desolate Jericho road, it's a hard pull, 15 miles of it, most of it uphill. And then they would have reached Bethphage, and after that, Bethany, where those loyal friends, Martha and Mary, lived with their brother Lazarus. And from there, on the Sunday morning, the approach to Jerusalem would have been made. The rough road would have rounded the shoulder of the Mount of Olives, and then suddenly, the best view there is of Jerusalem unfolded in front of them. That was the breathtaking moment, to see at last the city with all its associations. To the Jews, Jerusalem was the center of the world. If you could make a pilgrimage, you would go to Jerusalem, and you would expect to see a wonderful sight when you got there. As Jesus traveled on the road to Jerusalem, he was full of emotion, and perhaps his eyes were full of tears. It had been a long journey of teaching, healing, controversy, and opposition. Jesus looks to that city as his final destination, as it was for many prophets before him. However, he looks to it not with fear, but with deep concern for its inhabitants. 
Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Here he was at last, looking at the city that is the mirror of God's life, love, and peace. The city that symbolizes God's people, their hopes and their dreams, their history and their future. We can understand Jesus' profound, deep emotion in seeing that city and also his grief. I think he would grieve over the city today, and not only over the city of Jerusalem, but also in seeing Israeli people hobbling away from a bomb attack or a Palestinian child and father desperately trying to avoid bullets being fired in their direction. Or the hatred, the hatred that is expressed so openly and freely in God's own city. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have I desired to gather your children together? This is no pious or perfunctory comment. No, Jesus cries out with passion and emotion. It's an expression of his deep love for the children of God and for this holy city. He's making his journey to Jerusalem for some very specific and powerful reasons. He goes to announce God's love for God's people. He goes to call people to that love and to lives rooted in that love. As Jesus wants to gather Jerusalem to himself, he will go to that city where he will sacrifice his life for all who live in it. And indeed, for all people everywhere. It couldn't happen anywhere else except in Jerusalem. And his whole life, mission and journey have taken him to this point and place. His journey and action of going to Jerusalem reflect the action of God through the ages. God has come to his people, seeking them, searching for them over and over again. God has called them to himself, wanting them to be within the saving embrace of divine love and mercy. What Jesus is doing here is God's action. He comes to the people to invite them to God's embrace, to God's love. Jesus renews and reflects the divine action by going to Jerusalem to call, to love, to embrace. It was Jesus' action and it was God's pattern. God's way of doing things repeatedly over and over again in the history and experiences of God's people. God would seek and search them out, making a covenant with his people, calling them to keep their side of the bargain and promising to be with them always. God would come to them through words spoken by the prophets and in the worship of the holy temple, God would enter their lives through the teaching of the scriptures and through their daily living. Jesus was continuing this pattern of God's coming, seeking and searching. And he was doing it in an ultimate way, which would eventually lead to his death on the cross and subsequent resurrection. It would take its greatest form in Jerusalem, in the holy city of God, the center of the Jewish faith. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? How often have I desired? This is the voice of God's longing, of God's seeking, of God's searching love and mercy. But in spite of God's coming to his people, in spite of the longing, the searching, in spite of God's continual offering of love and mercy, in spite of all these things, people resist and even reject God and the promises brought by him. Jesus knew that. He knew about the prophets of old who had been stoned and murdered. He knew that human hearts could be cold and hard, rejecting, pushing God away. He experienced it in his own journey to Jerusalem. 
He offered love, love that many received, but also love that so many resisted and rejected. It's a pattern as old as the human heart. Our resistance to God takes many forms. Just read the newspapers or listen to the news bulletins to see some of them. Look at your own heart and mind to discern other forms of resistance. Anger, resentment, despair, bitterness, vengeance. We humans do it. We resist. We reject God's invitation. And yet still God comes. Still God invites. Still God seeks us, longs for us, weeps for us. Still God wants us to come to home to him. It's simply the heart and character of God to do these things. For God to long to gather us as a hen gathers her chicks, as a mother holds her own beloved children. In the Eucharist, or Holy Communion, God invites us to sit down, to eat and drink. We are invited to sit, to rest, to abide in God's love, to recognize the coming of God to us, to perceive the longing, searching, and seeking of God. It's the invitation to hear, and in a new and fresh way, the promises of God and of God's love for us. We are invited to move beyond our fear, beyond our resistance, beyond our shame, our guilt and rejection. We are invited to move beyond these things to the love, the grace, the forgiveness and mercy of God who will never let us go. And that is at the very heart of the Christian gospel. So this morning let us rejoice in his love for us as we come to his table to eat bread and drink wine together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.